Yes, I'm a, I do like numbers, I like pathways, but I live in the real world. This is the real world of blood tests for patients. And so what I'm going to talk about is a bit about the risk markers we conventionally used, and then two groups of tests, the blood test for sugar and carbs, and the blood test for fats, and just some other blood tests that you should be interested in. So traditionally the markers of cardiovascular disease are this deadly quartet, being overweight, being hypertensive, having abnormal fats, and having abnormal sugar. So two of those are in my world, the abnormal fats and abnormal sugars. Um, we heard from Tim earlier today, this is Gerald Reaven in 1974, and he was on the right track. His glucose leading to glucose and insulin being converted to fat and, and leading to change in lipids. But um, he sort of got um, stuck in the, in the uh, middle bit. If you have those four things, you are likely to die. This is the death, which is that immutable marker. So if you have metabolic syndrome, there's a 10% chance you're gonna die in the next 10 years. So it's not, you can't really argue with the existence of the syndrome. So sugar tests. The glucose test is the one we have focused on for the last 40 years. Despite the fact that we argue about what's a normal fasting glucose, in Australia we say 6.1 is abnormal, in America they say 5.5. And guess what, if you're pregnant it's 5.1. Now that's some of the problems with glucose. Fasting glucose. Why do you have to be fasting for a glucose? Because we want to know what your sugar level is after you've used up all of that dietary glucose from last night. And we're looking at your hormonal balance in terms of glucose. So you need to fast for that distance. And then it's telling us something about insulin. The random glucose, the one you take any time during the day, it's dependent on three things. What you've eaten during that day, what your insulin works like and how much of a storage place you've got for sugar. So how much muscle you have. Little people cannot put away 75 grams of glucose and they often turn out to have a diabetic glucose tolerance test not because their insulin doesn't work but because they don't have enough muscle to hide away all that glucose. So. And these are sort of the least of our problems with glucose. Glucose, that blood sample we take from you, the cells are still alive and they're chewing up the sugar level. To properly stop those cells from chewing up the sugar, we have to take in a fluoride sample on ice and nobody that I know of in Australia does that. So every glucose measured in Australia is 0.2 to 0.3 lower than it should be. Nobody knows that. Day-to-day -day variability. If I take your sugar today and it's seven fasting, well, tomorrow it'll be somewhere between 6.1 8.1. It varies so much from day to day. So one of the reasons why people are so insecure about using glucose to diagnose diabetes to get a handle on this disease is because it's a terrible test. Now, one thing that's helped us to understand glucose are these monitors that diabetic patients have that, that you can put a needle under your skin and they measure your sugar level every five minutes. And when you do that, you can see that here are the glucose levels by the finger prick, but here are the glucose levels by the, by the indwelling glucometer. And so this is really just a snapshot of what's actually happening. And what happens from day to day and so on, there's huge changes that we don't know about unless we do this sort of monitoring. And you know, daytime sugars a lot rise after breakfast, lunch and dinner, and nighttime sugars are low. But we don't get that. We rarely get nighttime sugars on anybody, do we? Okay, so what can we do? to overcome this. We can't measure sugar every five minutes on everyone. You wouldn't like those needles inside you anyway. 
So there is a test that we can use now that tests how, what your sugar level has been over the last three months. And it's this haemoglobin A1C test. Sugar is sticky, it sticks to everything, and it sticks to the red colour in our blood, which is the haemoglobin. And the amount of sugar that's stuck on that haemoglobin tells us what our sugar levels have been over the last three months. And it correlates, this is just using 18 glucose levels with haemoglobin A1c. The more you have, the better it correlates. So haemoglobin A1c is the best indicator of what your sugar levels are. And we've known that for years because the higher your haemoglobin A1c level is, the more likely you are to get the diseases of diabetes, like the eye disease or the kidney disease or the nerve disease. We've been using it that way for 30 years. But more recently, in 2009-10, um, people said, well, if that's the way to define disease, why are we using glucose? Shouldn't we be using haemoglobin A1c? And now the number one criteria for diagnosing diabetes is an abnormal haemoglobin A1c, not an abnormal glucose. The better test is the abnormal haemoglobin A1c. So if it's over 6.5%, we know you're at risk of the disease of diabetes. But there's a bit more to the story because here's 6.5% and this is cardiovascular disease and you can see that the risk of cardiovascular disease was rising way before we became diabetic. So in this range, so normal haemoglobin A1c is up to about 5.6. Above 6.5 is diabetes. And in between, you're on the way to diabetes. And whilst you're on the way to diabetes, you're running this risk of coronary vascular disease. We don't want to find out about your high sugar levels when you're diabetic. We want to find out when your heart disease starts to rise. Now this is just another a graph which um, not even our eminent researchers would have seen very often, if ever. This is C-peptide. C-peptide is insulin levels, average insulin levels, versus haemoglobin A1c. So when you're healthy, your insulin levels are low, and when you're on the way to diabetes, they're high, but then when you're diabetic, they're low. So this condition pre-diabetes is characterised by hyperinsulinemia. So not only can we say that 5.5 to 6.5 is pre-diabetic, at risk of coronary vascular disease, but we agree with Gerald Reven that this is the hyperinsulinemic syndrome. Okay, so that's Haemoglobin A1c, so if you have one, just have one test and have the A1c. It's 99% reliable. There are some people with abnormalities of their haemoglobin. We can look for them in the lab. Now here is how haemoglobin A1c changes with all the components of metabolic syndrome. So once you get over 5.5, you're more likely to be hypertensive, you're more likely to have raised sugars. And the two things I've arrowed are you're more likely to have elevated triglycerides and low HDL. That's part of the metabolic syndrome. So these are the two things we need to focus on is fat. But as um, Gary told you, and everyone's told you, the fat, where did the fat come from? It's come from the sugar. And I've just got a couple of graphs here sort of showing that Galactose can be converted to glucose, but fructose has to be broken in half and then it can be made into glucose. It's a bit of a rigmarole changing fructose to glucose. And if you've got plenty of glucose around, you won't bother doing that. So this is a, in these patients that have fructose and glucose, they don't bother making it into glucose. So if they don't bother doing this side chain around to glucose, what do they do? They split, split it into carbon units and use those pyruvate acetate units to make fat. So fructose and carbs make fat. Now, if that was all the problem was, that you're converting sugar to fat, well then uh, that would be okay. And, that's, and you just have a fatty liver like these mice do. As they're eating fructose, they just get fattier and fattier livers. So the liver fills with fat, 
But now a problem starts because it can't just keep that fat. It has to export that fat, usually to other tissues. But there's, there's a pro how does it export it? It exports it as this particle, the VLDL particle. That's how the liver exports. This is the fat track that goes out to the tissues. And if you're on a ketogenic diet and you're adapted to it, you will burn that fat. The muscle will say, yeah, I want some of that. If you're not fat adapted, it'll end up trying to find its way into um, adipose tissue. So here's patients on fructose and high levels of triglyceride, which are high levels of VLDL in their, in their fat. Now that's not the only form of triglyceride in the blood because when you eat a meal, you create a different particle called the chylomicron particle and it's full of fat and it transports fat to the tissues and so on. Now we're not interested, a bit like glucose, we're not interested in your dietary fat. We just want to see what you normally do with fat away from meals. And so what we need to do is get rid of this particle by fasting for 10 hours. That's why we have to fast for a triglyceride test so we can get rid of that dietary particle and we can concentrate on these particles. So fasting triglyceride, which should be under 1.5, is because we've got rid of the chylomicrons. Okay, so going through these particles, now the VLDL particle is what we're interested in because that's full of triglyceride. And if you're not burning it up and it's accumulating in the blood, it creates some problems. One of the problems is that the, the body's not getting rid of the triglyceride, it's accumulating in the blood. So it asks the other particles around, could you help me distribute all this fat? The muscle doesn't want it, what am I going to do with it? And HDL says, you, get, you give me some of that triglyceride, I'll give you some cholesterol ester, and I'll help you distribute that. But the problem is, HDL virtually gets worn out helping HDL, uh, helping the, the um, VLDL particles. So whoever has high VLDL and triglycerides loses their HDL. That's the first bad thing about high triglycerides, you lose HDL. <coughs> the next thing is even worse because um, LDL also wants to help out its mate, its big brother, and says, give me some of your triglycerides and I'll give you some cholesterol ester. And after a while, the LDL gets worn out, if you like, and becomes this small, dense particle. It becomes a different form of LDL than what was meant to be in the blood. And that small, dense particle is an altered form of LDL. LDL is normally a good thing. We need cholesterol in the body. LDL is being given a bad name because of this bad brother. So uh, we can size LDL. There's a lab that does it for $50 if you want, but I think it's a waste of $50. I'll tell you why. The difference we're talking about between normal and small LDL is 26 nanometers versus 24 nanometers. If you can tell the difference between those two particles, it's very subtle. But that subtle change means that this smaller particle is not identified by the liver. It will hang around in the blood, this small dense particle, and it will create havoc. And this is, um, we've mentioned before, uh, Ron Krauss, and he's done some work with, with um, Jared Reben. And this small dense particle correlates with everything to do with the metabolic syndrome, blood pressure, triglycerides, BMI. It is the characteristic particle and the pathogenic particle in metabolic syndrome. So why did I say it was a waste of time measuring it? Because our triglyceride levels tell us whether we're converting the LDL into small dense LDL. If your triglyceride levels are over 1.5 millimole per litre, then most of your LDL is in the small dense form. End of story. If your triglycerides are under one millimole per litre, which most LCHF patients have, your LDL is, virtually none of it is in the small dense type B form. Okay, so how, much, how many Australians have triglycerides over 1.5? Well, 35% of men and 22% of women. You know, this is 
this is the avalanche of heart disease that we're trying to cover up with statins. So the issue is that LDL isn't bad. Anything that changes LDL is bad, and triglycerides change LDL, make it small and dense. But other things may change LDL, like oxidisation, glycation, and certain genetic defects. You don't want to change that LDL particle because that LDL particle, as Gary told you, can find its way into the blood vessel wall and then the macrophages are interested in it. Because the only way modified LDL can be, t can be consumed by the body is through the scavenger receptor of the macrophages. So they're in your blood vessel wall, then watch out. So, you know, it's been given a bad name, LDL. Not all LDL is bad. Modified LDL is bad. We used to say, yes, if your LDL's high and your HDL's low, then your risk is compounded. But even in patients who have the same LDL to HDL ratio, raised triglycerides are bad. So this ratio between good and bad does not give you the whole story. Triglycerides gives you the whole story. So what I say is that any doctor that looks at the cholesterols and stops at that is 30 years out of date. Any doctor who looks at bad and good is 20 years out of date. If you realise there's modified LDL, you're only 10 years out of date. If you realise that triglycerides are the most important modifier of LDL, you're, you're where you should be. And uh, if you want more information on that, um, Jimmy Moore's book covers that and he's got um, Ron Krauss and all the experts talking. Okay, now just some issues regarding LCSHF. If we're eating more fat and we're delivering more fat to the muscle, we're getting more empty tracks. And the LDL is the normal empty track of L VLDL. Once you remove the triglycerides from VLDL, it becomes the normal buoyant, fluffy LDL. So that's one of the reasons why people that eat high fat should have a slightly higher LDL because they've got more VLDL traffic. So trigs, now trigs decrease because they're not accumulating in the blood. As soon as you get them there, the, the muscles want to eat them. You've, you've adapted. Um, if your trigs are high um, or your VLDL is high, so LDL will increase because of that catabolism. LDL might rise, but, but it's a not small dense LDL because of the lower trig. LDL might be higher, but it, there's less small dense LDL. HDL will increase. Total cholesterol should increase because both HDL and LDL have increased. You shouldn't be worried about that. It's telling you that the good things are happening. Um, this ratio decreases and this ratio just plummets on the LCHF diet and it's probably the most important. Now just some other tests, fatty liver, so normally the liver looks sort of red and hard like that in a fatty liver which occurs in 20 or 30% of Australians, that's what it looks like. Um, and we can test for fatty liver just by measuring some liver enzymes, the raised ALT or raised gamma GT. And what does fatty liver correlate with? A triglyceride level of 1.4 means you've got a fatty liver. A triglyceride level of 0 0.9 means you don't. A HDL above 1.6 means you probably don't. And there's a whole lot of mechanism which I'm not going to discuss thankfully. But there's a whole lot of studies that talk about how uric acid is a predictor of the metabolic syndrome and how uric acid rises with sugar consumption. But the thing that I was interested in, because I knew that there was two phases in life when triglycerides skyrocket normally, and that's in children who are about uh, three months to one year of age, and in pregnancy in the third trimester in pregnancy when triglycerides skyrocket in the third trimester. The mother is trying to fatten up the baby. And in those, both of those situations, uric acid rises at the same time. 
So uric acid is not only a pathological indicator of fat accumulation and triglyceride production, but it's also a normal part of life. So it's, it's something that really does interest me. And it probably is an important factor in why most of the champions of low carb, high fructose are men and sportsmen who often have high uric acid levels. And some of the failures in LCHF in terms of fat loss are women. Because women have, particularly younger women, have much lower levels of uric acid than men. So I'll, I'll bring all that together soon. One last test. This is the striated, the striped muscle that is cardiac muscle. And there are some proteins within that um, structure. They're like the ball bearings that the muscle works on called troponin. And we've discovered that um, by measuring this troponin, we can exquisitely measure cardiac damage. And so in the past, we used to sort of see these levels and say, well, if the troponin level's above 50, you must have had a heart attack, end of story. And then we started measuring lower, uh, whoops, lower levels. I'm sorry, the animation's not going to work. But we started measuring levels between 14 and 40 and 50. And we thought, well, they're not having heart attacks, are they? Because there's twice as many now. And, and that's happened in the last five or ten years. There's tw we're exquisitely sensitive detecting cardiac damage and we're calling them heart attacks and we're not really sure whether it's, it is or not. But what the last slide says is that normal range for troponin is under 14. But if you're 3 or 5 or 7 or 13, it predicts whether you're going to die of heart disease. So it, it, it's an exquisite marker of heart damage. So now just some quick words. Um, measures of kidney function, they do predict um, mortality and diabetes, but they also rise with age. And it's very hard to work out whether this is age related or disease related. CRP, which people would love to work as a marker of inflammation, it is an ex another exquisite marker of inflammation. But if you go on a one hour run, your CRP will be elevated because of those small muscles you've got. So it's a bit too sensitive and you have to repeat it a few times before you're confident that your CRP is always elevated. And then homocysteine, something that also been a marker. Yes, it's a marker, but it's non-modifiable. People have tried to reduce homocysteine with vitamins and it doesn't change mortality. So I'm not really sure how useful that is. Now I'm just mentioning a few movies because um, I think like uh, Tim, um, after the serial killers launch earlier this year in Melbourne, I was inspired by Shane Watson, somebody who changed his outlook on life based on diet. And, um, and not only that, but Damon, who you heard from before, he's involved me in his movie. Now those two things together said to me, I better go on to this diet. <laughs> because it's a good idea and I might be embarrassed otherwise. So um, that was me about two or three years ago with a weight of 99 or 100 kilos. And in the first two months after the LCHF diet, I lost 10 and now I've lost 15 kilos. And it's been an interesting experiment, but it has improved my life immensely. And in a way, I thank um, everyone that's in this community for that. And here are my results. So I've been testing my, my results for 30 years. I live in a laboratory, I just tested it. <laughs> so my cholesterol, my total cholesterol level, two months after the diet fell to 5.1. I wasn't expecting it, it should have increased. According to my understanding, it should have increased. But then I repeated and it was 6.1. So, so my cholesterol level hasn't really changed. My LDL, the bad cholesterol level, I was expecting that to increase as well because of the VLDL becomes LDL. It fell after the first two months and now it's back up to about 3.8 or 4, which people would say was bad. But I'm saying I'm not worried about it because I know it's not small and dense. Um, my HDL, which has always I've been, this was probably a lab error because I've always been <laughs> under 1.2, is now 1.6 and every doctor in the audience knows that that is impossible to do with any of our current therapies. 
and you, you can do it with LCHF. Um, and then my triglycerides, which were telling me I'm 100% small dense LDL, and now 0.9, 1.1, I know there's hardly any small dense LDL there. So in summary, for carbs, test haemoglobin A1c, forget about the rest. 5.6 is where your cardiovascular risk starts. 6.5 means you've got diabetes. For fats, try to get those triglycerides under one. Then you know at least that major determinant of modified LDL is removed. Um, but if it's under over 1.5 and you know the majority of your LDL is in a small dense form, you should be doing something about it. You can take a statin if you want, but there's a better thing to do about it. And for the other tests, if you've, if you've gone too far and you're wondering you've got a fatty liver, do the ALT. If you're wondering whether the LCHF will work, I think that if your urate level is high, I would, I would predict that the LCHF will, will work very well for you. And that's, that, that applies to most men and many women. And again, if you're really worried about heart and heart attacks, measure your troponin. Because it might be the only reassurance that um, we can find. So lastly, um, I thank particularly Rod Taylor. I'm not sure he's going to get much of a thanks, but as you've seen this group grow, he's acting as like a global glue, bringing people together. <laughs> And so I thank him personally, and I think we, owe, we all owe him a lot. <laughs> and I'd like to last uh, thank uh, Louisa, my daughter, who's got type 1 diabetes. You have to live these diseases to understand them. Thank you. <laughs>